Hey everyone, welcome into your weekly address. Tonight's topic. <clears throat> hey everybody, welcome into your weekly address. Tonight's topic is the continuation of the evolution of the political parties in the United States. And we focused a lot on the third section of that two party system evolution, uh, which is the Democratic and Republican parties. Now, where we left off from class of the day was in the early 1900s. The parties were really sectionalized, meaning the North was a strong Republican base, whereas the South was a strong Democratic base. And there, a lot of the reasons for that stem from the occurrences that, that split the, the parties apart during the Civil War and Reconstruction era, when the Southern base was primarily Democrat and the Northern base was absolutely Republican. But over time, the sectionalism would eventually dissipate. And the major cause for that was, uh, were, the major causes, I should say, for that were two things. Number one, Franklin Roosevelt, who was a Democrat from the state of New York. And number two, the Great Depression and New Deal. Now, we've talked a little bit about the New Deal already as a great extension of the burgeoning uh, role that the federal government played in the lives of the people. Specifically, uh, the, the New Deal was that watershed moment that created a, a, a great sense of federalism uh, in the modern era, where the federal government was taking on a much larger role than it ever had before. The New Deal was the brainchild uh, of Franklin Roosevelt and many of his close advisors, uh, and it was their response to the crippling effects that the, New De uh, that the Great Depression had on the American economy at the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s. Now, Roosevelt was from New York. Uh, he had served as the governor there, but he was a Democrat. And so that reinforces something we've been talking about. Not everyone in the North was a, was a Republican, and conversely, not everybody in the South was a Democrat. So Roosevelt was a Northern Democrat. And when he won election in 1932 over Herbert Hoover, who had been the president when the Great Depression began, Roosevelt leaned very heavily on gaining support from the South, which was something that was unique because, for example, when we talked about Abraham Lincoln's election, Abraham Lincoln received no votes in the, in the, in the Southern Electoral College states, and yet Roosevelt was able to, to, to go down to the South and campaign uh, well enough to, to receive a lot of the Southern votes. So you have a Northern Democrat, and I should say that Roosevelt was wealthy. He came from a very... Uh, blue-blooded, uh, wealthy family in New York State. He was uh, a distant cousin of Theodore Roosevelt, who was a president in the early 1900s. So Franklin Roosevelt entered the White House and really emerged in a new light that the Democrats had not previously sort of, leaders had not sort of uh, carried out. What you got to realize, the dynamic of this emergence of Franklin Roosevelt during the Great Depression and New Deal era being a northerner, Roosevelt had different views than some of the southern Democrats. For example, remember the southern Democrats were promoting segregated governments in southern states. They were blocking anti-lynching laws. And so Roosevelt, however, being a northerner, didn't share those kind of hostilities towards African Americans and minority groups. But where Roosevelt was greatly different was he believed in a strong powerful federal government. And in contrast to the Republicans, Roosevelt felt that the only way to solve the crises of the Great Depression was to be active. The federal government needed to be an active role and be extremely vigilant in ensuring the lives of the people and the economy would survive during this brutal economic uh, time period. The extension of presidential power, challenging legislation in the Constitution, battles of the Supreme Court. We're going to go into greater detail about the Great Depression later because it's such an all-encompassing unit. But for what you need to understand about with the Great Depression is that the Great Depression changed forever the landscape of political party affiliation in the United States. Because of Franklin Roosevelt being a Northern Democrat and because of the Great Depression and the extension of the, the federal government with the New Deal, waves and waves and waves of African Americans and minority groups began to vote primarily for the Democratic Party. 
this phenomena, this change in votership and the affiliations that people had with the political parties was known as the New Deal Coalition. Please make sure you get that term down, the New Deal Coalition. And that coalition was a robust, new, active group of voters who are now changing from Republican to Democrat. There are a litany of factors that explain why the New Deal Coalition existed. Your most fundamental reason to recall why the New Deal Coalition came about when it did come about has to do with the, the New Deal. Because the government began programs like welfare, uh, relief, job you know, assistance, uh, it, 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 it brought about social security, it was pro uh, for labor unions. These brought in new voters to the Democrat Party that had never before voted Democratic. African Americans received plenty of assistance from the federal government due to the New Deal. Labor unions were given greater rights than they ever had been before. So consequently, people who were in labor unions began to support the Democratic Party. And that is essentially what transformed the 1930s and 40s and moving on even still to today. Labor unions still are almost unique or almost ubiquitously democratic. African Americans tend to vote Democrat across the board. Tend, again, is the key word. You're going to find outlying examples. But playing the percentages here, Democrats, the Democratic Party today, as we know it, the party of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, that party draws a massive amount of support from African Americans, labor unions, and other minority groups, as well as many urban dwellers. Because again, these were the people that got hit the hardest during the Great Depression and New Deal, along with farmers as, as well. Now, obviously, the New Deal, uh, its legacy exists primarily with Social Security. That's one of the most lingering uh, changes that was brought about by the New Deal. But remember, we talked about how in the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson reinforced the idea of the welfare state with programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and direct welfare assistance in what Johnson called the Great Society. And throughout the 1960s, the Democrat Party showed uh, a proclivity for supporting civil rights, which once again re kept reinforcing its status as the party that would protect civil rights, the party that would uh, protect uh, welfare. And so as a result of, of where the Democratic Party leaned on some of these social issues, the party became much more well known for carrying out and protecting uh, the idea of the liberal society, where the government would be uh, really protecting the rights of the people and providing for the people. And while the parties have certainly shifted again since the 1930s and, and, and with a great society, the Republican Party, on the other hand, has tended to shy away from taking on a responsibility of providing direct relief. It tends to shy away from supporting mass welfare programs like universal health care, for example. And, and so consequently, the Republican Party socially has been viewed in, in a lot of, uh, on a lot of issues as contrarian to the Democratic Party. Today, our, our, our political party scene is, is quite simply uh, looted uh, with, with partisanship. Issues now are blurred um, more so than ever before in American history, and that was what the textbook stated. You know, the Great Society really continued to, to the trend of the New Deal coalition in that minorities and African Americans and labor unions and whatnot would continue to vote Democratic. But as we look at 2016 and the election that's, that's coming up here, the party affiliations and the issues that, that are unique to our time period uh, tend to lean in different ways than they have in the past. And now more than ever, uh, Americans remain divided uh, in party affiliation because there are just so many issues that are out there and in contention. And you know that's why, again, we've got to reinforce the ideas of polarization, how every era has its own issues. And every era provides people with a different opportunity to choose which party they want to vote for and which party they want to support. But no matter what, remember, Whatever party you register for, you are not compelled to vote for that party. So people can pick and choose for the candidates, however they may, may, may decide.
And so I'm going to leave you with that. It was a relatively short weekly address. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to really get back in the swing of things and talk about the primary elections, how the parties nominate candidates at both the state and national level. And that should set us up beautifully <coughs> Excuse me for the test that we have on Monday, the cumulative test. And then we'll have uh, our Tuesday, our first um, speeches, our expect, uh, acceptance speeches, and the vice presidents will, will work together to outline their, uh, their views. So I'm going to leave you guys with that. I'm about to get ready for the flip side extravaganza. I'm excited to see uh, maybe some of you out there. I will be bowling, so check me out if I was bowling well. The dogs are somewhere here. They don't want to be on camera now, so let me just wrap up and wish you guys a good rest of your Wednesday. Enjoy the debates tonight. Take care.